Yes, I still have a pumpkin in my background. That's not gonna change. <laughs> I tried to record this video like four times, but I'm struggling with the words. So we're gonna go with just story time instead of me trying to lecture to you and trying to sum stuff up. So here we go. <laughs> so if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that I've had this kind of battle of selves <laughs> in the past couple of years. So, um, you know, of course we all know I identify as a witch. We all know that I am really into witchcraft history and teaching it and creating a very accessible um, access point for a lot of people coming into this path in a way that isn't very isn't classist you know racist a lot of other things that is a really big focus of mine um, my other kind of personality and career is um, video games. I actually went into graduate school uh, for a PhD in sociology because I was study I wanted to study um, video games and I wanted to study the culture around them and how it perpetuates really bad shit. I had these kind of two worlds and it wasn't until recently, actually until this past year, that I realized that they could kind of cohabitate and how they cohabitate in my life. Basically at the beginning of my path with the Norse pantheon, um, I felt like I couldn't touch it, like it didn't belong to me. There was something about it that felt, even though Odin had walked with me all of my life, um, and I knew this, there was something about it that felt out of my reach. There was something about it that felt like it didn't belong to me, that I couldn't actually wear it, you know? Right around actually the same time that that questioning started happening, the video game God of War came out. The storyline of this God of War so Kratos is the main character. He is the um, Greek god of, of battle, basically, of war, god of war, obviously. But he ends up in the Norse pantheon and he befriends some and becomes the enemy of the Norse gods and goddesses. And the fact that this came to me right when I was trying to like open my Norse path and trying to listen a little bit more was life shaking is what I will say. As I played the game and I walked through the environment that was created, these like glacial canyons and these huge lakes and these beautiful snow-capped mountains and these giants and you know, all of the different worlds that you can explore like Muspelheim and Alfheim. As I went through each world, I started kind of understanding my place there. Now, I fully understand that like all of those were artistic liberties, right? We have no like primary sources really of what these spaces look like. We know it's based in Norway and in, in Scandinavian countries, right? We understand that landscape. So of course they can replicate that. But there was something about hearing languages, something about seeing runes carved into stone everywhere. There was something about hearing the, the names of places and hearing stories about them and hearing Mimir talk about the, the different stories of, of the giants and the gods and everything. There was something in this storyline, in this fabricated world that felt so much like home to me that I basically cried every time I played. I wrote about it and said like, I had the same reaction to walking in this digital space that I, like that you would walking into a cathedral. You get quiet. You understand that you're like in this really sacred place, right? Um, I had that reaction to it. It was this awakening for me. Um, I believe in the middle of me playing that game, that's when Hungen and Munnen came to me in my dreams. Like they physically handed me a key to Yggdrasil. Um, which I know is not a story for everybody, but for me, it was this uh, this this passing of like, this is knowledge you should access here. We're giving it to you. So my experience with God of War isn't necessarily that like, I took what was written in that game as factual, and then I kind of took it and made it into my own religion. That's not what I'm really trying to say here in terms of like how to use video games in your own inspiration for witchcraft. It was more that being in that space, being in that simulated space was a gate opening for me. It gave me the language upon which to research. It introduced me to deities 
although they were like narratively written in a way that doesn't necessarily accurately represent them. I'm not saying that I'm trying to like one-to-one -one use what they, the world they created for my own practice, right? However, it it's the kind of thing where like once you see it once and once you kind of experience it and walk through it, because it was a video game for me, I was able to kind of walk through it and look at it and see it and live in this space really. Um, that it felt, I understood that this is what home felt like. The same thing actually recently happened as I've been playing through Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, which takes place in, um, I think it's like 9th century, 8th or 9th century England. Basically as the Norse invade England full of Saxons and full of all of the like pagan tribes of like pre supreme Christian England, right? <laughs> so it's isolated to this time and place and I've been playing as a woman character, Eivor, who is a Yom's Viking or a, a Viking that goes and is a warrior and that is her trade. Um, and I remember, I remember this. It's been a very interesting experience because like, if I were to kind of uh, think of myself like me as an entity, as a soul, right? If I were to think of myself as my ideal, most open, most at home self, what I imagine is an ax in my hand, covered in leathers and furs, my hair braided back like it is now, um, living in a longhouse near water in my homeland. like. I have been a warrior in a previous life. And that's something that I understand in my body from like a, like it feels like a genetic makeup. Like it's in my DNA that I have this personality, this, th these memories, all of these things. I can't explain it from like a factual standpoint because obviously I've never been any of those things, but it's something that's incredibly familiar to me. And so to walk into this game and be able to more or less play myself <laughs> especially because you can play Eivor as a queer person, has been, I've, I've cried most times that I've played because there's something about it that transports me to what feels like home. So my experience with video games has been this. They provide, so one thing that's pretty rad and also pretty not rad, which is something that I actively am trying to remedy in the video game industry. <laughs> Pagan themes are used across the board in video games, across the board. Uh, gods, goddesses, landscapes, all of this like, I mean, we, there's countless games that deal with like the Norse pantheon, with the Greek pantheon specifically, I mean, Hades, alone is like a huge game this year. And it takes place with all of the chthonic deities of Greek pantheon in the underworld. Literally you're in Hades and your dad is Hades. Like all of, there's so many stories that are used in the video game industry. I'm getting excited, I'm throwing my necklace around. Um, these stories are used so often, sometimes to a detriment, don't get me wrong. Sometimes they're just used because the stories are already written and it's easy to kind of take that and regurgitate it in a different way and tell a different story or the same story, honestly. However, it's also something really amazing and fortunate for us as pagans because some games, some, some of them, some stories, honestly, we don't even have to be talking about video games here. We can talk about any narrative idea, so movies, books, video games, TV, anything like that. All of these present opportunities for us in this life to live in other spaces, in other times, in other lives. For me, it's been absolutely wonderful and a big processing moment for me to play in, as a, as a Viking, which is an incorrect term for the record, but as a Norse woman, a Norse warrior going through like pagan early Christianity England, like Saxon England, it's just such an experience that like I don't get to have any other time. It's a, it's a mirror for me that feels at home. It's a really beautiful experience. For me, these have been huge gate openers to my own practice. Like I said, it's not necessarily that I'm going into these spaces and taking what they what they offer me as fact because like that's just irresponsible researching anyway. It doesn't matter if you're getting it from a book, a movie or whatever. Of course, I always recommend researching it. But 
what it allows me to do is almost like simulate an aspect of myself that doesn't necessarily feel at home in this life, in this body, in this universe that I'm in, right? Um, it allows me, it, it offers up a mirror so that I can see myself in a different way and I can see where I feel at home and where I might not feel at home in this, in this life. I could go into like 17 other conversations from here, but I think that's kind of where I want to stop for today is that I think there is this tendency in witchcraft to want to lean into primary sources. All right, Mayday. To want to lean into primary sources, whatever that means to you. There's very few primary sources in witchcraft. Very, very few. One, there's like millions of definitions of what witchcraft is. Two, mythology itself has been passed down for years and years and years and years and years and has a subjectivity to it that feels a little weird. Really, yeah, like there's there aren't very many primary sources because it's an experiential embodied spiritual practice, right? So there's this tendency for us to be like, oh, I don't wanna get inspiration from books or movies or TV, or I don't wanna feel seen by them because they're not primary sources, right? But if we think about it, if we take a step back, if we look at mythology, right? Mythology more or less is the telling of story to offer a lesson, right? To offer a lesson or to offer an archetype by which we can live our lives. These stories were told over campfires and over, you know, dinners and in the long nights of winter um, to entertain and to teach lessons to the, to the future generations, to teach lessons to the future generations of hope, of resiliency, of hero, being a hero and what that actually means, right? So these are lessons about the human experience. Isn't that what we make? now in fiction, these are still stories about the human condition, whether they show up in TV, movies, video games, what have you, right? Oh, shoot, even fanfic, right? Fanfic written on Pinterest. <laughs> these are stories about the human experience. And if that rings true to you, if something about an archetype presented to you or someone's alternative interpretation of something rings true to you, why not follow that? Of course, within reason, I'm really not talking about creating your own religion of stuff. I mean, that can kind of be dangerous, but at the end of the day, spirituality is about feeling seen. And like, what necessarily does it matter that I feel incredibly seen by wit being a witcher, right? And being in the witcher game and being in, uh, I think that one's like 1200s Slavic region, right? <laughs> like. What does it matter that it's in a video game format? What matters to me is that that lifestyle and that environment and that story speaks to me. Um, that story is one of belonging and chosen family and uh, protecting your chosen family at all costs. What does it matter that that story came out in what, 2015 as opposed to 2000 BC, right? There is a credence of time, but like allow yourself a little space to be seen in media because I think there's so much knowledge in witchcraft and there's so much archetypal access that we can have to the characters that we see in all of these forms of media. That's how it's been for me in video games. I have found myself in video games. I've remembered beautiful things walking through, you know, Saxon England and seeing Stonehenge. I can actually like, even though it's simulated, be in a time period where I walk in a field and I walk up to an altar and I offer it leathers that I have acquired, my, acquired from hunting um, and in turn get blessed by the gods. Like, even though it's a video game, you're still experiencing these things and it's still happening in your brain and it can still make you feel like you're at home. So first of many videos, I guess. <laughs> this is a challenging one to articulate, but it's something that I talk a lot about on Twitch and uh, it's why I started my Twitch channel, honestly. Um, I call it a witch playing witch shit because so often pagan themes are used in video games and those who identify as pagans don't actually acknowledge it in any way. And uh, I think there's so much to be said and done with those two in combination. 
Um, and so I guess I'm gonna start saying it. <laughs> Stay tuned for uh, more videos on this. Hopefully I can articulate them a little better, but I don't know. Maybe this one will be rambling, maybe not. But regardless, give yourself a little bit of, of, of leeway. If you feel seen by a world, if you feel seen by a character or a, uh, a race even in a, in a, in a world that is de deemed fantasy, how can you bring that archetype into your own life in a way that makes you feel seen in yourself and alive? I'll see you next video.